I believe we have a slide for that as well. There we go. Okay, so I don't know how well you guys can see it all the way in the back, uh, but uh, this is a basic overview of Romans, uh, where we've been so far, and a little bit about where we're heading. Uh, when you open up the book of Romans, it starts with uh, an introduction, the first 17 verses of chapter 1, and basically Paul there is talking about the ministry of the gospel, and that the gospel is the gospel of God. And he talks about his longing to impart a spiritual gift to the Romans, to preach the gospel to these uh, believers, to establish them in the gospel. And so Paul lays that out, and then at the very end, in verses 16 and 17, he gives the uh, thesis, the theme for the book of Romans, which is the righteousness of God. Okay, and so then, right after Paul introduces the righteousness of God, though, in verse 18 of chapter 1, he begins a whole new section. He starts off with the wrath of God. And so from uh, 118 through 320, you have the wrath of God and how that all humanity are the proper subjects of God's wrath. Uh, God uh, has uh, shown that everyone is under condemnation because all are sinners for the Gentile and also for the Jew. Paul makes the point that being a Jew and having the law doesn't help you any. That there, there's no help with the law as far as righteousness before God. And so that continues all the way through chapter 3 and verse 20. And then in verse 21, Paul says, But now a righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known or has been manifested. And so at that point in verse 21 of chapter 3, he picks up and resumes what he had begun in chapter 1 and verse 17, the righteousness of God. Uh, so uh, that whole thing is about that. And then at the end of chapter 3, all the way to the end of chapter 3, Paul talks about Jesus Christ as the propitiation and expiation uh, uh, for us. Uh, and we talked about those terms. Basically, it means that God is satisfied. God's wrath came down on Jesus on the cross. His blood acted as satisfaction. God saw the blood. He was satisfied. And now you and I can be justified, declared righteous before God. So, uh, is everything okay? All right. Y'all getting that feedback? All right. So, what's the, what's the plan, Scott? Do I just keep on? Okay. Again, the problem is right here. The wizard is back there, the guy who can really do it well. Uh, so, all right. And so then, um, after uh, chapter 3, verse 21, all the way through chapter 5, you basically have justification by grace through faith. And Paul, then in chapter 4, turns to Abraham as an example of uh, justification by faith. And, uh, and how God saved him by grace. And then in chapter 5, Paul begins to move towards uh, uh, not only justification, but reconciliation. And he begins to assure the Roman believers uh, of their salvation, basically, is what he's doing. So uh, all the way through chapter 5, and then the last half of chapter 5, Paul compares, or rather contrasts, the uh, ministry of Christ and his redemption and Adam. And no matter how bad Adam messed things up, guess what? The ministry of Jesus Christ was greater. Paul talks about grace abounding. So grace is so great that it overcomes the mess that you and I have found ourselves in. And then in chapter 6 through 8, uh, which we're going to finish today, is about the death and resurrection with Christ. How that we are united with Christ and as a result, the death he died and the resurrection is both a reality for us and the way of Christian living. The death and resurrection, that gospel, is the paradigm for the Christian life. And so that's what chapter 6 through 7, or 6 through 8 is about. In the middle, Paul talks about the law. Basically, he says Christians are dead to him. Uh, that, that's how we relate to the law. Um, and then in chapter 8, uh, we see a lot of talk of the Spirit. And uh, there is a lot of talk of the Spirit, but the chapter isn't about the work of the Holy Spirit. It's about how the resurrection of Jesus Christ means eternal life and adoption and a new life for us here on earth. So that's kind of a recap, and today we're going to finish uh, chapter 8. Uh, but then next week, uh, Pastor Brian is going to start us off in chapter 9. Chapter 9 through 11 is about justification, God's righteousness, in relation to His plan with Israel and the Gentiles. So that's a basic overview. But today we are in Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. So, and uh, uh, Cameron had already read that. So as we open up here, um, and I just, yeah, we also have an app, uh, Convergence Church app, and uh, this is the first week we've been able to do this, but we put the notes 
the sermon notes on the app. So if you don't have a Convergence app, oh man, you need to get that. I mean, that's the place to, that's the getting place right there. We got everything you need there. We got the Bible, we got everything. Uh, so if you can download the Convergence Church app, and uh, we have uh, the Bible there, you can, uh, and also uh, the sermon notes. Uh, so you can uh, look at those too if you want to. Verse 31, Paul begins, to, Paul begins to say here, What then shall we say to these things? Now what things is, is he talking about here? As you read through here, you realize that he isn't saying anything about the Holy Spirit. And uh, he may allude to it once or twice. But uh, he's not just saying these things that have been talked about here in the, in the verses before. As you carefully read this last part of chapter 8, you begin to realize that a lot of things that he's talking about go all the way back to chapter 5. And what Paul is saying is saying, in light of the fact that we're justified, in light of the fact that we're reconciled to God, in light of the fact of the work of atonement of Jesus Christ, in light of the fact of the work of the Spirit, uh, that we're going to go from, from groaning to glory, in light of the calling and predestination of God, what do you say to all of that? How do you respond? And here's what Paul says. Paul says, this is how you respond to that. Here's what we are to make of that. And so then he says here, in the, in the second part of verse 31, If God is for us, who can be against us? Some people have said that this is the climax and the summary of Paul's theology of justification. When you look at what justification is, Paul says it all boils down to this, guys. God is for us. Period. Enough said. When you get down to the basic level of it, God is on our behalf. God is in our uh, benefit. He is for us. So Paul says here, this is what we can say to this. God is for us. He is on our side. He is in our corner. God is for us. And so here Paul says, with a triumphant note, God is for us. He is for our behalf. He is for our good. And so that's why he returns in verse 37 to this, this note here. We are, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Why are we more than conquerors? Because God is for us. When God is for you, you are more than a conqueror. This word more than a conqueror is very interesting. It's uh, uh, here, you can see in verse 37, we are more than conquerors. One, two, three, five words in English, one word in Greek. And the word, Greek word here, hupernikao, it means to win in the face of all obstacles. It's this idea of being super victorious. Whatever you throw at us, we win. That's what that means. All we do is win. We're always crushing it. We're killing it. And that's what this word, hupernikao, means. We're killing it, guys. Yeah. All we do is win. We are more than conquerors. And uh, that's why we are, because God is for us. And so the title for the message, as you can see on your outline, is We Are More Than Conquerors. We Are More Than Conquerors. So here's the big idea. All right, there's the big idea. We are more than conquerors because God is for us. Amen. This goes back to a very ancient, ancient truth that God has taught His people for a long time. In Psalm 56 and verse 9, the next slide, we read here, Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know, that God is for me. I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? If God is on my side, I don't need to fear. And that's one of the things that Paul's done with this passage is, is telling everybody, hello, um, you don't need to be afraid. You can be assured of your salvation because God is for you. That's the bottom line. Psalm 118 verse 6 says pretty much the same thing. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? And so what Paul is going to talk about here in this passage is all the things that could possibly come against us. Paul's answer is, guess what? God's on your side. He is for you. End of story. And so we begin here in verse 32 again. 
He says, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. Interesting words here. The word spare is the same word that God used in Genesis 22. The same Greek equivalent when God commends Abraham for not sparing his own son Isaac. That is, Abraham was willing and about to sacrifice his son. You remember that story? Well, uh, this is the same word, and Paul's alluding to that sacrifice. What Abraham was willing to do, God actually did. And then he says here, he, he uh, gave him up for us all. This is a very important word used in Isaiah 53 about the suffering servant giving his life up for many. And so Paul says, God did not spare, but he gave up his own son. You and I are sons and daughters by adoption, but this is his own son. Like he says in chapter 8 and verse uh, 3. For what God, uh, for God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And so God sent his own son and he gave him up for us. There's that beautiful phrase again, for us. And so he says here, here's his argument. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Paul's argument is this. If God gave us Jesus Christ, then will he give us everything else? What is more valuable than Jesus Christ? You put things in the balance, the entire universe, and Jesus Christ, there's no comparison. And so Paul's saying, if God gave you all of this, won't he just give you everything as well? If someone gave you a billion dollars, would they not give you a penny? Paul's making an argument from the greater to the lesser. And all things here doesn't mean all things just as, as in terms of salvation. All things here is comprehensive of everything. It's like what we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 21 through 22, um, which I think we have. Uh, so number one, uh, we are more than conquerors because God will give us the universe. That's our number one point. But I think we also have 1 Corinthians chapter 3 on there too, do we not? Okay, yeah. Okay, so 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 21. So then let no one boast in men, Paul says, for all things belong to you, whether Paul or Paulos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come. Paul says, again, all things belong to you. What Paul is saying is, guess what? As Christians, you need to realize God has given us everything. It's comprehensive like we read in verse 28. We see the all things there. God is talking about everything that there is. It makes sense because we are co-heirs with Christ. Christ inherits everything. We, along with him, inherit everything. And what God says here is he will graciously give us all things. What an amazing truth. That we are more than conquerors. Why? Because God will give us the universe. Everything. We conquer and we get the whole of creation. This is good news for those Christians who are poor and those who are wealthy. Because in the end, we get it all. I don't know how that's going to look. I don't know how that stewardship is going to work out. But God promises us all things. So if we're wealthy, we have to keep that in mind. Whatever things we have. Hey, we get everything in the end all. Anyhow, if you're poor and you don't have a lot of things, guess what? You get everything in the end anyhow. I think if every Christian really took this truth to heart, people would live a different way. We would be more giving, more sacrificial giving. We'd be more invested in serving Jesus Christ and less interested in the things of the world. If we really believed and internalized this truth, because God is for us, we are more than conquerors. No matter what we lose, we lose our business, if we lose our finances, if we lose whatever that we have in our possession, in the end, God says, that's okay. You get everything. That's conquering. That's God for us. And as we turn here to verse 33, we begin to step into a uh, courtroom, if you will, as Paul begins to lay out some of these um, uh, judicial, these legal terms uh, that he'll talk about here. And we'll find out that not only have we conquered in the sense that God has given us everything, 
But we're conquering in the sense that we win in God's uh, cosmic court, if you will. Look at verse 33. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? <laughs> I mean, listen. This word charge here is an official accusation. And there, he says here, we're God's elect. So you already got a problem here. The word elect means a special status before God. So who, who can successfully bring any charges against those whom God has chosen? Instead, here's what he says. It is God who justifies. Here's the divine verdict of Christians. We are declared to be righteous. Not we haven't been made totally righteous yet. We've been declared righteous. So God looks at you and me, and he sees us in our sin, but he says, on the basis of Jesus Christ, we are righteous in Jesus Christ. So who can bring a charge against God's elect, those whom God has chosen? In the divine courtroom, we have won. So number two, here it is. We are more than conquerors because God declares us righteous. We are more than conquerors, number two, because God declares us righteous. Charges will be brought for sure. Satan will accuse us. The world will accuse us. There's all kinds of charges, but they won't stick, if you will. Why won't they stick? Because we are more than conquerors. God has declared us righteous in his sight. The verdict, the decision that matters is the one that comes from God. And God says no matter what is said about us, in the end, we are declared righteous. That's conquering. That's what it looks like for God to be for us. In verse 34, he goes on here. Not only charges, but then another judicial term here. Uh, who is to condemn? Who, who will bring condemnation? The word condemn here means uh, to sentence to uh, punishment, to make a uh, statement of guilt, and to uh, sentence to punishment. Well, chapter 8, verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So there is no condemnation. The only one who can condemn is God. And what does God do for Christians? He just justifies. He doesn't condemn. He justifies. God disciplines, yes. There's all kinds of things we could say, but He doesn't condemn. God only justifies. That's God for us. That's being a conqueror. We are more than conquerors because God declares us righteous, even in the face of charges brought against us, even against any sentence of condemnation that would be brought against us. It is God who justifies. No charges. No condemnation. Our judge is a justifier. And here's, what he, and here's how his answer is. Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, was raised. Now what does that mean for us? That Jesus died and that he was raised? Well, look back at chapter 3 and verse 24. Here's what that means. It says, and we are justified by grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, who God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness. So verse 24, we are justified by the death of Christ. And then at the end of chapter 4, we read this. Who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. So Christ can condemn us. That's what all that wrath and condemnation was about in the first three chapters. We are under condemnation. But in Christ, the one who can judge us through his death and resurrection justifies us. Our judge is a justifier. It reminds us of uh, Isaiah chapter 50, verse 8 through 9. Isaiah chapter 50, which we have on the slide. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. How can Isaiah be so bold? How can he be so confident? Behold, the Lord God helps me. He's for me. Who will declare me guilty? Put it positively, God has declared it's not only not guilty, 
but righteous. He is justifying us. He's at the right hand of God. Look what he says here. This one who justified us is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. In chapter 1 and verse 4, we looked at that phrase, the Son of God in power. And it talked about how Jesus on earth would be the Son of God in weakness. But at the right hand of God, He's the Son of God in power. Right now, as we are speaking, a man is running the universe. Let that settle in your brain for a while. That's amazing, isn't it? A man is running the universe right now. The man Christ Jesus, the God-man. And so Jesus is at the right hand of God, the place of power. He's running the universe. And He is the one who is interceding for us. So Christ Jesus, who can judge us, justifies us with His death and resurrection. And He's an omnipotent interceder. The whole thing is in our favor. The whole courtroom has been set up for us to succeed. See, we're more than conquerors because God is for us. He's the justifier. Only our, judges, our only judge is our justifier and our advocate and omnipotent one at that. So when condemning faults come, when a condemning attitude and accusation of the world come against us, we have to admit we're not perfect. But we are conquerors, more than conquerors, because despite what can be said about us, in the end, God's word is justification, not condemnation. Now in verse 35, Paul turns here in verse 35 to something a little more personal in perspective. We step out of the courtroom and we enter into something a little more personal here. He says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? The love of Christ or the love of God is three times in this second section here. Verse 35 speaks about the love of Christ. Verse 37 says, Him who loved us. And at the very end we read, The love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what does he mean here by the love of God or the love of Christ? Is he simply saying how God feels about us? I know God feels very loving towards us. But there's something more substantial. Something more objective that Paul is getting at here. When Paul talks about the love of God, the love of Christ, he's talking about the sacrificial death of Christ, the atoning work. He's talking about what Christ has done for us. In verse 32, uh, in verse 39 here, we read the love of God in Christ. This love he had shown by, in verse 32, giving up his son for us, that sacrificial death. That's why he asks in verse 30. Five, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Just speaking about Christ's death and resurrection. Look at chapter 5 and verse 8. Chapter 5 and verse 8 says this, But God shows His love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's like what Paul says in Galatians 2.20. The life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave His life for me. That is, He loved me by giving His life for me. When Paul talks about the love of God in Christ, when we talk about the love of Jesus Christ here, what Paul is focusing on here in Romans is what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And what he's saying is, that atoning work of Jesus Christ, you can't be separated from it. Because, as he says in Romans 8.30, I mean, he, he puts it all together here for us. Those he predestined, he called. Those he called, he justified. And if you're justified, guess what? You get glorified. And that's what Paul is pointing at here. When he says you can't be separated from the love of Christ, that means you can't separate justification and glorification. Somebody could be thinking to themselves, the Romans perhaps saying, well, we have all things. God's justified us. Christ is interceding for us, but how do we know that that redemption that we have in Christ, we won't be separated from it somehow? What about all that stuff? Couldn't we get taken out of that? Paul's answer to that is no. You can't be separated from that act of love that Jesus Christ did on the cross. 
that atonement, that justification, you can't be separated from it. Those who he justified, he also glorified. So number three. Here's the third thing. You haven't already seen it. Okay, let's just stay there for a while until we need to move. Okay, uh, number three. We are more than conquerors because God guarantees that we will always have a saving relationship with him. God guarantees we will always have a saving relationship with him. Now, Paul is sure about this. Look what he says here in uh, verse four, uh, 38. For I am sure, and he goes on and lists all these things. These are things that will not separate us from what Christ has done on the cross. Paul is sure about it. This is called the eternal security of the believer. Some people today aren't sure about it, but Paul is sure about it. And this is a wonderful truth that we just need to take in and just let God soak into our hearts. You need that security in your relationship with Jesus Christ. This is one of the many places where God talks about that in the life of the believer. When my uh, son Elijah was born, I couldn't wait to get home from work to see him, to play with him, to spend time with him. I love to kiss his big old head and give him hugs. When he was born, his head was about 50% of his height. He was a big-headed boy. And uh, I just ran home to just love on him, you know? Buying toys, spend as much time with him as I could. One time we were on vacation, we were taking one into a restaurant. We were at the beach. And we set him up. Oh, oh, thank you, sir. We set him down between us. And all of our attention was focused on him. And someone said as we were leaving, well, you can't tell that he's loved. I spend, uh, I don't know, almost 100 times a day, I kiss him and tell him I love him. When he was about four years old, he came to me one time in total seriousness. And he said, Daddy, do you love me? Inside, I was like, what? How do you not know that? A hundred times a day I've kissed you and told you and hugged you and told you I loved you. I spent two hours on the floor with you. But I didn't say all that. I said, Elijah, I love you now and I will always love you no matter what. As long as, you know, forever. And then a big old smile came across his face and he hugged me and says, I know, Daddy. And then he went off and played. I think we're like that sometimes. I, I, I think sometimes we, we ask ourselves, does God really love me sometimes? Over and over again, our Father lets us know, I love you. I love you. And it's not just the feeling of love that's never going away. The work of love that he did on the cross, that's never going to change. You will never be separated from that. You have eternal security in that. You didn't do it. You didn't put it together, and you can't tear it apart. This is what God has done. He justifies, and then he glorifies. And that's regardless of any suffering we experience here. Look what he says here. In verse 35, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? The answer to that is no one. Shall trouble, shall tribulation, or distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, that is being destitute, not having things, danger, Natural dangers, man-created dangers, sword, that is war or conflict. Paul isn't trying to be exhaustive. He's trying to get examples. He's trying to say there's nothing that's going to separate us. No amount of suffering or any kind of suffering is going to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. He goes on here in the end of verse uh, 36. He says, he quotes here, For your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. And here's a quote from Psalm 44, where the righteous are suffering. And Paul quotes this to say, the righteous do suffer. In fact, it's part of God's plan. It's inevitable. The irony of the name it and claim it, people, is, is incredible here. They use stuff like this, the, we are more than conquerors, and we are victorious, and we are triumphant, and all this stuff. And they use it to support their name it and claim it uh, heresy. But the irony here is, 
This more than conqueror's idea is being conquerors through suffering, not above suffering. And so we are overcomers, but overcomers in suffering. This is the third time that Paul's mentioned suffering. In chapter 5, he talks about suffering. In chapter 8, he talks about suffering uh, previously. And then this third time, he's talking about suffering. Something about the Romans, the Roman church's idea of conquering, I guess, and the Christian life and suffering just doesn't go together. Maybe they thought that the suffering and persecution they were going under is something that uh, shows that they're not saved or that God's favor is not on them. Paul assures them, yes, suffering is part of God's plan for the righteous. And guess what? You are still more than a conqueror. Not only is it conquering regardless of any suffering we may experience, but we are conquerors against anyone or anything that exists. Verse 38. Neither death nor life, that is death itself, nor anything that we encounter in life, nor angels nor rulers, that is fallen angels we would assume here, spiritual powers, the rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height or depth. Paul is talking about in all of creation, perhaps all in heaven and earth. Nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And Paul adds this great phrase at the end. In case, in case we're trying to find a loophole, in case we're saying, as some people will say, well, you know, no one can separate you and nothing can separate you from the love of Christ, but you yourself can separate yourself from the love of Christ. Paul says here, anything else in all creation. And that closes the loophole here. Literally, the literally translation is neither any other of creation. He doesn't say thing or person. He just says any other of creation. So there's no person, there's no thing, there's no circumstance, there's no force. Not even you yourself can get yourself out of the love of Christ that is, uh, that is in the, his work of redemption. What does Paul assure us here? He assures us this. We will all suffer. That's part of God's plan. We are all secure. We can't be separated from the love of Christ. We will all persevere and we will all conquer. We are more than conquerors because God is for us. So here's a summary of what we've looked at here. Hey, Blythe, do you have that summary uh, slide? There we go. Yeah. We are more than conquerors because God is for us. That means for us, he gives us everything. That's conquering. That's killing it. He declares us righteous. We win in the courtroom of God. And he guarantees our salvation. All of this is great. But the reason why we're more than conquerors is because Jesus Christ is a conqueror. Look what we read in the ver end of verse 37. Through him who loved us. That's why we're more than conquerors. The book of Revelation is not about who's the Antichrist today. The book of Revelation is basically this. We had to sum it up. Jesus Christ wins. If you and I persevere, we win with him. That's, that's the message. So here's what we read in Revelation chapter 5. And verse 5 through uh, in verse 9. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll of the seven seals. God can unfold his plan of redemption. That's what he's talking about. How can he do it? He is the conqueror. <coughs> verse 9. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and open the seals. That is to do God's work of redemption. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. That's you and me. And you have made them a kingdom and a priest to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. We conquer because through the blood of Jesus Christ, He has conquered. Verse 37 says, through him who loved us. 
Look, uh, problems come, doubts come, but in the end, what God says about our salvation, about the Christian life is, we are more than conquerors. We don't win some, we get it all. God graciously gives us all things. We don't just get by with God. We just don't hope the big man upstairs takes it easy on us. We are declared righteous now. And that's the verdict we receive before Him. In spite of any accusations or condemnations. And in the end, you and I can't be separated from what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. We didn't put ourselves in a position of atonement. Christ Himself did it. He called us, not ourselves. And you can't separate justification and glorification. We are more than conquerors. Because God is for us. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Your word is truth. You have spoken to us. I pray that we would find a home for everything you've said in your word. Um, Lord, may we disregard any things that I've said that don't uh, line up with your word. Your word is true. Uh, no matter what, Lord, may your word fall on our hearts with power and conviction. May we take what you've said here and may it just dwell in our hearts and we work it out in our lives to your honor and glory, to the edification of your church, to the reaching out of the gospel of Jesus Christ and extending the Lordship uh, and your glory throughout this world through uh, people coming to faith in you, Lord. I pray for us, especially here at Convergence Church, Lord, that we would claim this identity of more than conquerors and that we would base it on you. We thank you. We praise you, Lord, that you are for us. That's everything to us, Lord. That's all we need. If you're for us, then what can be against us? And we rejoice in that truth here today. And let us, Lord, rejoice in that for all of our lives. That will be our song for eternity. Uh, you are for us, and your grace has done all this. So, Lord, bless us as we continue in worship, as we worship your name. And uh, thank you, Lord for your conquering work on the cross. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.